Hello, welcome to another online lecture for Girdles and Completeness Theorem. Uh, I wanted to pick up on something that we didn't quite have enough time to, d to finish or discuss the, the proof of in class on Monday, last Monday. Um, so to remind you, we were talking about this structure right here. This is just the natural numbers uh, with one constant symbol zero and a function symbol s. Uh, so the domain of this structure, of course, is the set of all natural numbers, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And the interpretation of the constant symbol 0 is going to be the natural number 0, and the interpretation of the, uh, this, the, the function symbol s is simply going to be the successor function. So in class, we, we talked about this, and we're interested really in the theory of this structure. Uh, but before I talk about that, I just want to remind you that we have in this structure, we have a way of naming every possible natural number. So each natural number corresponds to a sequences of s's followed by a zero. So zero is zero s's followed by the constant zero. So that's the, the, the constant zero will be that. Uh, if you just apply one s, you get the successor of zero. S squared here, or s to the second power, is, stands for s applied to s applied to zero, and so on. Um, so the so the in this way, we have a way of naming for every natural number. There's a corresponding numeral. So this is. A term in our language. So s to the n zero, this is kind of a macro, a way of, of describing the term which consists of n s's applied to the constant zero. So this is a term in our language that, and in this way, we every natural number has a specific term in the language. Now what we're what we're interested in is the language, the first order language, where the only terms in our language is the constant, uh, I'm sorry, the only function symbols in our language are the constant symbol s, and the constant symbol is the, the constant symbol zero. And what we're interested in is the theory of our structure, natural numbers with successor. That's just the set of all sentences. So remember, a sentence is a, is a, formula of, of from this language here that doesn't have any free variables, such that that sentence is true in this structure. Now, here's a set of axioms. So these are just formulas in our language. So the first axiom says that uh, the successor applied to anything is not zero. The second axiom here says uh, that this successor function as a function is one to one. The third says that every non-zero element must have a predecessor. For every y that's not equal to zero, there must exist some x such that y is the successor of that x. And the remaining infinitely many axioms simply say no matter how many times you apply the successor function to some element x, you'll never reach x. Uh, you'll, you'll never come back and hit x, so you'll never loop back and reach x. So a couple of things, just sort of obvious things to note. Um, if I wanted to, pr so I can prove from this axiom system, I can derive for example, the fact that 2 equals 2. So how do I do that? Well, remember, we don't have the way we refer to natural numbers. We want to show that the numeral 2 is the same as, well, the numeral 2. So, so I want to somehow show that from this axiom system, I can derive the fact that the numeral 2 equals the numeral 2. So uh, what that really means is, so I'll write it this way, so as from as we can derive the fact that the successor of the successor of 0 is equal to the successor of the successor of 0. Um, but this follows because we have just a general principle of first order logic that if x equals y, so if I can prove that x equals y, from any axiom system whatsoever, then I can prove that f 
of x must be equal to f of y, where f is any function symbol, actually any term whatsoever. So you can always replace equivalence. Um, so this is a general law of first order logic. So to derive the fact that two equals two, um, uh, all you need is uh, standard first order logic and this function symbol s. Uh, what's a little bit more interesting is we need to, sh we would like to be able to also prove that two doesn't equal three. So we want to show that uh, the numeral two is not the same, cannot be equal to the numeral three. Well, that's actually going to follow directly from S2 and S1. So I'll just give sort of a high level sketch of, of what the argument is. If I, so take, consider S of S of zero and S of S of S of three. So if those were equal, if I could prove that those were equal, then I would be able to prove by S2, just take a, um, let X and Y, uh, let X be S of zero and Y be S of S of zero. This allows me to remove one of the, one of the S's. So I would be able to prove S of zero is equal to S of S of zero. Um, and again, applying S2 again, this allows me to prove that zero is equal to s of zero, but by s1 we know that this is a contradiction because zero can't equal s of anything. Okay, so in this way we see that the, ax the axiom system can be used to prove either that two natural numbers are equal or that two different natural numbers are, um, or the same natural number is equal to itself, or the two different natural numbers um, uh, cannot be equal to each other. Now, um, it should be, I won't go through this proof, but the consequences of this axiom system are all true facts about the natural numbers with successor. But what we're really interested in showing is that, in fact, the theory of the natural number successor is just equal to the consequences of that axiom system. So that the, this theory is, in fact, axiomatizable. Now, we mentioned briefly, this is a bit of a digression, um, saying that we're able to axiomatize this theory using this axiom system is not the same thing as saying that the axiom system somehow uniquely identifies or uniquely picks out the structure NS, our intended structure. So to see that, um, just take any model of this of of this axiom system okay so any model must have a domain and a way of interpreting zero and a way of interpreting s now since we have a way of interpreting zero we know that we can apply the successor to zero and I know by, I believe it was S2, that applying the, uh, sorry, by S1, that applying the successor to zero, I get a new element, it can't be zero itself. Um, so I have a new element here. And secondly, if I apply the successor to this element, I get a, another unique element. Sorry, this should be the successor of the successor of zero. And I can keep doing that. So applying successors as many times as I want. And what I get is, of course, in this structure, I have a copy. So formally, it's an isomorphic copy of this structure here. But there might be some element A in the domain such that A is different from zero or the successor of zero or the successor of the successor of zero and so on. So I might have some element in the domain that is what you might call non-standard, a non-standard element of the domain. And, and all you mean by non-standard is it's just not a natural number. Now, if I have this element, A, then I know that I can apply the successor to it, the successor function to it, and I know that this has to be different from A. And furthermore, again, the same argument up here applies, so I can keep applying successor to A, 
to get um, an infinite sequence of natural numbers going in the right direction. But since I know a is different from zero, then a has to have a predecessor. So there has to be an element star such that when I apply the successor to star, I get a. But star itself cannot be zero. Um, and since star itself, because if star itself was zero, then a must be s of zero. Uh, but we know that the successor function has to be um, has to be um, uh, one to one, and so star can't actually be zero because we are supposing that a is not equal to s of zero for any of the uh, for uh, is not equal to any natural number. So star itself can't be zero. That means that star has to have itself a predecessor. Let's call it star prime, and the same argument applies. And so we actually have a copy of the integers z. So this turns out to be a copy of the integers of z. So we can actually characterize what all the structures of um, all the structures which which make all of the ac all the consequences of the axiom as true in the following way. Well, say that two elements of our domain are equivalent if we can apply s a finite number of times to a in order to yield b. And it's easy to see that this is an equivalence relation on A. And so we have one of the equivalence classes must be an isomorphic copy of our intended structure. But there are going to be all these other equivalence classes, um, which each one has to be isomorphic copies of Z. Now, we might have countably many equivalence classes altogether or uncountably many equivalence classes altogether. But the important point is that um, just because we, s we know, and this is what we'll, we're about to prove, that we can axiomatize this structure using these axioms, the axioms are still not strong enough to uniquely pin down our intended structure. All right. Now, in order to prove that our, um, so let me go back here. We want to show, remember, what we're trying to show is that this theory is axiomatized by, um, uh, by this set of axioms. Um, actually, I'm not going to prove that. I'm going to prove something a little bit stronger, namely that the theory itself, this theory NS, is decidable. So there's an algorithm that decides for any formula whether or not it is um, uh, uh, true in the structure or not. So there's an algorithm that decides this set. And because um, uh, if the theory is decidable, then it has to be recursively enumerable or effectively enumerable. And we saw in class that every effectively enumerable set of sentences has to be axiomatizable. Now, this doesn't show that this set of sentences, AS, in particular axiomatizes this structure. That requires a separate argument, and, and I'll leave it up to you to work out uh, those details. So what we really want to prove is that the theory T, the theory of natural numbers of successor, is in fact decidable. And the way we're going to prove that is we're going to show that it admits elimination of quantifiers. Now what that means is that for any formula phi, and this formula phi might have lots and lots of um, quantifiers in it, I can always find a quantifier-free formula psi such that my theory t thinks that phi is equivalent to psi. So in order to determine whether or not phi follows from, from t, so whether or not phi is a consequence of, of the theory t, it's enough to check this formula psi, this quantifier-free formula psi. Now, why does this give us decidability? Well, given an arbitrary formula phi, I can, in a decidable way or an algorithmic way, find the formula psi that is equivalent to phi. So in order to determine whether or not phi is an element of my theory or um, uh, follows from my theory, it's enough to check whether or not psi follows from my theory. Now, 
Proving a, a elimination of quantifiers is not always so easy, but fortunately, fortunately there's a theorem that makes our job a little bit easier. Um, all we really have to do is check not that every formula phi is equivalent to a quantifier free formula, but rather we simply have to show that formulas of a very special form, namely formulas of the form, there exist an x such that a finite conjunction of formulas, each of which is an atomic formula or the negation of atomic formula, is quantifier free. So in other words, I can find a quantifier, uh, a quantifier free formula psi that is equivalent to this formula, which is of a very special form. Um, I'll sort of just state this theorem without proof. Uh, but the proof follows uh, by induction on the structure of phi. So the way it goes is you suppose that for every formula of this form, I can find a quantifier free formula psi such that T thinks that phi and psi are equivalent. Then I can prove that in fact I can lift that to all possible formulas in my language. Okay. All right, so now let's show that this theory admits the elimination of quantifiers. By the previous theorem, it is enough, so it is enough to consider formulas of the form there exist x alpha zero and, and alpha n. So I need to consider formulas only of this form right here. Now, each alpha i is either going to be an atomic formula or the negation of atomic formula. So an atomic formula will be something of the form uh, s to the n of, let's say, uh, let me write it as uh, s to the n of v equals s to the n of u or s to the n, sorry, s to the m of u or s to the n v is not equal to s to the m of u where v and u are variables or zero. So each alpha i is an equation or the negation of an equation. Now, it's easy to see, we can just assume that v, that x must occur in each of the equations. So we assume x must occur in each alpha i. The reason is, if x doesn't occur in alpha i, um, then let's just take, uh, so there exist x, alpha, and beta. If x doesn't occur in alpha here, this is just logically equivalent to alpha and there exist x, beta. So we can pull out all the conjuncts that, that in, in which x doesn't actually occur. So we can assume that x occurs in each of those alpha i's, so each alpha i is of the form s to the n x equals s to the m u, or s to the n x does not equal s to the m u. Now, by the observation I made earlier, we also can assume that u is in fact different from x. Now why is that? Well, if u is equal to x, then I can just simply replace s to the n x equals s to the m u with, so if n equals m, I can replace that conjunct with zero equals zero, and if n is not equal to m, I can replace it with the, the conjunct with zero doesn't equal zero. So if u is equal to x, I can just, by looking at how many s's there are, I can either say that definitely has to be true or that definitely is not true. 
Um, so I can replace that conjunct with a simpler formula, zero equals zero or zero doesn't equal zero. Um, and um, these don't, of course, have x in it. So by the previous argument, I can pull those out. OK, so now we're in a situation where we have this formula. There exists x, alpha 0, and, and alpha n. And each alpha i is of the form s to the n x equals s to the m u, or the negation of that. S to the n x does not equal s to the m u. Now, um, we have two cases. Case one is, so either all of the alpha i's are going to be the negation of the, the equation. So alpha, so each alpha i is of the form uh, s to the n x does not equal s to the m u. So all of the alpha i's are the negation of an equation. Or there's at least one that is not the negation of an equation. That'll be case two. But for now, let's just consider case one. If that's the case, then I claim we can replace the whole formula. There exists x, alpha zero, and, and alpha n with 0 equals 0. That's just simply derivable. So the intuition here is that if it's the negation of all of these equations right here, I just have to, um, that, that's easy to see that we can derive um, the negation of, of well, so the, the intuition is that it's very easy to make these negations true. Uh, because we can just set x to be, um, so suppose u is equal to 0 in this case, and uh, just let x be uh, uh, anything so that n is different from m. Okay, so if all of the alpha i's are negations of equations, I can replace this entire formula just simply with the formula 0 equals 0. This is, I didn't really give you the argument, I gave you a high level sketch of the argument, but let's just, um, it, it, this should be a little, a moment's reflection should tell you that this is true. Uh, but what we're really interested in is the second case. So this is case 2. And in case 2, there is some alpha i such that alpha i is equal to s to the n x equals s to the m u. Okay, so s to the n x equals s to the m u. Now, remember that u here does not contain x. Now, I claim that I can simply replace this conjunct with, let's call this the term t. So I'll say that uh, s to the mu is the term t. I can replace this conjunct, so we can replace alpha i with t is not equal to 0 and t is not equal to s of 0 and t is not equal to s to the n minus 1 of 0 because we can because this conjunct whether or not this conjunct is well we can just talk about true rather than derivable in the axiom system whether or not this is true depends simply on whether or not the s's there are n s's here matches the number of s's over here and of course if n is equal to if n is equal to 0 if n is equal to 0, uh, then replace alpha i with 0 equals 0. Now, once we've done that, so we replace alpha i with this equation, t not equal to, or this conjunction, t not equal to 0, and t not equal to 1, and t not equal to dot, 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 
Um, we look at all of the other formulas that we see. Um, so we look at all of the other conjuncts that we see. So we have, re remember, we have there exist x alpha 0 and, and then we have this alpha i, which we're dealing with, and alpha n. Now, suppose, for example, there's another alpha j, which is of the form s to the k x is equal to, uh, for example, u, where u is some term. Uh, well, we shouldn't use u, so let's say v, where v is some term. Uh, now, what we do is we simply say, so we add s's to both sides so that we have, uh, so we, we say, we note that if this is equal, then it's the case that um, s to the k plus m x is equal to s to the m uh, v. So we add s's to both sides of this equation, add exactly, sorry, it shouldn't be m, it should be n s's to both sides. Now once we do that, we can turn this equation, remembering that s to the n x is actually just equal to t, to this term t, we can turn this into the equation s to the k t is equal to s to the n v, where v is some term in our language. So I'm able to take any alpha j, which is of this form, I add s's to it and I turn it into an equation of this form, s to the kt equals s to the n v. So I replace alpha j with this equation right here. So if this is true, then this equation has to also be true as well. <coughs> if the same would hold if we have some other alpha j prime which is equal to s to the k x is not equal to v. The exact same argument hold except we would replace this with s to the k t is not equal to s to the n v. So what I've been able to do is I take my formula, there exist alpha zero and, and alpha i and, and alpha n, and I replace alpha i with this equation, t is not equal to zero, and t is not equal to s of zero, and dot, 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 and t is not equal to, let's, let's say, s to the n minus one of zero. And then I take all of these other formulas, and I replace them with equations of the form, it'll essentially be s to the k t equals s to the n v, sorry, s to the n v. And that's true for all of these other formulas. So what I've been able to do is take all of these conjuncts and remove the x's. So note that x doesn't appear, x doesn't appear in any conjunct. so we can drop the quantifier. So I've been able to take each of these conjuncts, remove all of the x's from the conjunct, so that makes this quantifier useless, so we, drop, we go ahead and drop that quantifier. So I'm able to turn any formula of this form into a formula that doesn't include a quantifier. And that actually complete, completes the proof given that our given our earlier theorem. So we've been able to show that the theory of NS admits elimination of quantifiers. A little bit of extra argument gives you that that tells you that the theory is decidable, and so it must be axiomatizable. Um, in order to show that it's axiomatizable by the set of axioms we discussed earlier in this lecture. That requires a little bit of extra proof. Essentially what you want to show is all the argument I just gave proving that the theory of NS admits elimination of quantifiers can be done using just the axioms AS.